Well, why don't I go ahead and jump into the presentation today and um, just for those who weren't on last week, we're, we're going to do a little bit of a deeper dive into what, um, what we talk about, which is the first letter of lasso, which is the lateral or, or brand expansion. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we can dive in. And I have no issues with anyone uh, chiming in during the presentation because I think that way makes it more fun and enjoyable. But um, we're going to uh, put you on, um, uh, shut off your videos and put you on mute to start. And then if you want to um, come in and, uh, and, and add a comment or ask a question, I'm, I'm fully game. But before I do that, I just want to introduce, um, and let me just do this because I would be remiss to do it otherwise. Let me introduce Ella Burge. Ella is a new member of our team. Uh, Ella, why don't you just take a minute or two to tell everyone who you are and what you're, what you're doing and how you came to be with, um, with Brand Alive. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Pete. Um, good to see all of you guys. Thanks for joining us this morning. Um, like Pete said, my name is Ella. I'm a senior at um, the University of Georgia studying marketing. And uh, my marketing advisor uh, sent out the information that Pete was looking for an intern. So I kind of on a whim applied for it and have been on the team for um, coming up on two weeks now, but it's been a really fun two weeks. Um, and I know as you guys have probably figured out, there's so much to learn from Pete and from Brand Alive. Um, so I'm excited to join the team and to get to know you guys um, as we, figure out how to expand our brands and, um, you know, create, create things that um, really are impactful. So I'm excited to do that with you guys. Awesome. Okay. All right. Let's go ahead and jump into the presentation. I'm super excited to have everyone on the call today. Okay, um, I want to just make sure that I'm, it says I'm talking. So I heard, I saw that there was a mute for a second. Okay, so today we're talking about brand expansion optimization, and we're talking about how brands expand laterally. This is a topic that we talked about last time, two weeks ago, but what we're going to do today is dive into some more case studies, which I think is one of the greatest ways to learn about anything that has a principle. So a case study or, you know, in a sense, a really a story about these different brands will help bring it alive, which I think will help us um, to have a better appreciation for what it really means to expand your brand. So before we start that, let's talk about the LASSO framework and methodology. LASSO stands for Lateral Addictive storied, scalable, and ownable. Um, so we've been talking about the first letter in the LASSO acronym, which is lateral. And what we've created is uh, this five um, area framework, which basically evaluates each brand according to each of these different criteria. So lateral being from category to category, addictive is really self-explanatory, and we'll talk about addictive next time which is for me, one of the most enjoyable uh, categories in the Lasso framework, because if you think about why are we addicted to things, why are we addicted to brands? Uh, it really is an enlightening kind of thing, right? Because sometimes we love to be an addictive, but sometimes we feel a little bit kind of like, I wish I didn't feel that way, but, um, but okay, I am and I'm gonna enjoy it anyway. So uh, I think you're gonna enjoy uh, that conversation. The next is, it's called, is S for storied, and, and I hope you know already the, how important stories are to brands. So whether you're a young brand or an old brand, you can have a story, and the more unique your story is, and usually with entrepreneurs, you're part of the story. So that's an important part to think about and to make relevant and known to your target audience. The next S is for scalable, and we'll talk about how things scale, and scaling can be geographic, but it also can be um, scaling from one, um, maybe one uh, uh, language to another. It just, it really, there's all different dimensions of scalability. So we have to think about what it means to scale. 
And the last one is ownable. And you'd think that this was pretty straightforward. You either own it or you don't. You either legally own it or you don't. But ownability or ownable is, is so much more than just the pure legal sense of it. And we'll get into examples where lots of times, not only do, um, does the, the company own it, but also maybe if it's an organization like a franchise organization, the franchisees feel like they own it. Or in many, many instances, the consumers feel like they own it. And when they do, the, the technical owner, the, you know, the legal owner better be paying attention to that. Okay, so let's talk about the uses of the lasso model. So this is terrific if you're a brand expert because it helps you prioritize your IP. It helps you understand which have the greatest opportunity, which brands are underexpanded, which are optimally expanded, which are overexpanded. And when you know that, you'll know how to move and how to manage them and how to make sure that you're aligned with the brand's, let's call it DNA and brand's purpose and mission. But what if you're not um, an expert? What if you're the brand owner, but you're still trying to learn this thing? Well, we've created an algorithm that you can use that helps you score the brand, and then you can assess whether or not your score equals that of the algorithm. And if it does, great, you've reinforced what you believe. And if it doesn't, you can start to question why it may or may not. And if, um, if there's a lot, a lot of questions you can't get answered, then you know, we're here to help you. And then finally, uh, for those not capable of scoring their brands because you're just new to this game, I still believe the Lasso framework can be relevant and a useful tool to you because there's lots of questions we ask. And as you get more educated and through the webinar series or through some of our tools or through other platforms or research or um, study that you do, it'll become more and more understandable and therefore more valuable to you. So let's talk a little bit about what we mean by lateral expansion. That's the first critical step uh, in a successful licensing program. And what we say is expanding a brand beyond its operating sector into wider life categories encourages customers to think of it as their brand. And I mentioned that earlier when I talked about Ownable. And the last point, oops, sorry, let me just jump back for just a second. I wanted to make one other point about this is that when a brand makes a lateral leap, it gives, um, uh, there's kind of things that have to be considered. For example, the new expression of the brand should fit with the personality and the qualities that consumers know and treasure. Second, when it makes sense from a design point of view in that the brand looks like part of the new sector, which it's seen. So that's important. It has to look strong and connect it and fit it from a design perspective. Third, a brand makes a lateral leap when it aligns with what consumers see as powerful driving force of the brand. Fourth, when, when it is something consumers want more of in their lives, right? We crave the brand and we hope the brand will expand into new categories because we feel like that would be a great place for the brand because we want to have more of the brand in our lives, more of the brand in our personal universe. And then finally, when the brand itself is desired by consumers. And you know those brands that we absolutely love and can't be without. Okay, but there's a challenge or goal of lateral, right? So you have to strike the right balance between surprise, where when the brand appears where it was not expected, right? That's the surprise. And alignment, the appearance of the brand mirrors what the brand means. If you have the surprise but no alignment, it's going to be one of those where what I'll call is not too, it's too lateral or it's not convincing and it doesn't pass the smell test. And we've all seen that, right? We've all said, I don't get it. Why is this brand in this category? This category makes no sense. And let me give you um, a couple of examples in just a second. So before we get there, let's talk about the decision on how to move laterally. First, helps define not just where the brand is seen, but also where it is most profitable. So it doesn't help you to expand into a category where there's no profitability because you're gonna hurt your overall business, right? And there's not going to be the demand because the, 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 the category of the sector is lacking. Second, you wanna expand ambitiously with the right brand and you have to have the brand take on new meaning and new revenues. So 
when all of these things work in concert with each other, then you're in a place where you can move laterally and know that it's going to be beneficial to your organization. So I told you I was going to share a couple of examples where expansions have gone wrong. Here's three examples that I mentioned last time. The first one being Vespa perfume. For those who don't know, Vespa is typically known for a small uh, scooter. Um, it's a European, it's actually an Italian brand. Uh, the scooter typically is, um, uh, the target is um, females, uh, young females typically, although many males uh, ride Vespas as well. But it's kind of known as a, you know, kind of a fun uh, brand that, um, you know, is, is enjoyable, but it's not one where you'd say, okay, if I drive or ride a Vespa, I want to wear Vespa perfume. They don't own any permission, and we'll get into this in a second. We'll talk about the brand expansion point, but their brand expansion point does not give them permission to go into perfume, and therefore, no pun intended here, Vespa perfume does not pass the smell test. Secondarily, how about Hooters Airlines? Okay, what is Hooters known for? It's kind of known for a fun place to get, um, to hang out, to get what I would call average uh, tasting food, but in an enjoyable um, drinking environment, right? So, um, and you know, we all kind of know, uh, or most of us should know what the, best, the, the Hooters experience looks like, but you're not thinking, I, I think in general, people don't consider Hooters, um, that experience being moved to an air, aircraft. Um, for, first off, uh, depending on how long the flight lasts, you may not even be able to get up out of your seat. So how can you experience what you experience in a Hooters restaurant? But let's just say it is an extended flight. Well, then maybe some of the people could enjoy that maybe in the front section where there's a bar area. But for the most people, it would not, um, it would not transfer. And so this is what I would seriously call an expansion gone wrong. And then the last one is um, Smith & Wesson. And Smith & Wesson is a, a gun manufacturer, a rifle manufacturer, high quality rifles. Um, and, and maybe there should be some clothing that they create for uh, the hunting experience. But what they're creating here is uh, leisure attire. And the brand just doesn't have permission. And in each of these cases, these expansions did not last very long and therefore um, sadly failed uh, and, and probably along the way hurt the brand. Okay, before we get into brand expansion, it's important to discuss or define uh, three different things. The first one being, what is brand growth? And these are my definitions, but I think they're important to have because it gets confusing. And when we talk about this, it's good to know kind of a framework from which, we're, from which we are talking from. So I say brand growth is when a brand expands the core business, right? Whatever the core is. For Vespa, it's the, it's the uh, motorcycle. For uh, Smith & Wesson, it's the rifles or the, uh, the guns and ammunition. So you expand the core business into a new geographic region or, or further saturating in an existing region, right? More uh, of the same product into a new region or more density in an existing region. And it allows the business... Um, to, uh, to, to grow through its own capability. So think of the GoPro brand of, uh, of camera, you know, they're selling more and more into new countries or they're selling more and more within the region where they already sell. Okay, well then what's a brand extension? Well, brand extension, I say is also known as line extension. It's about building out a brand product portfolio or about continuation. So um, if you think of a whiskey company extending its brand like Jack Daniels, Jack Daniels has a core brand of, uh, of whiskey, but if they then add flavoring to it, so maybe they add a, a maple version of it, uh, that would be an extension. If you think about the Coca-Cola company and the Coca-Cola brand, Diet Coke, uh, caffeine-free Coke, Cherry Coke, those are all brand extension. And then finally, we get to... Um, a brand expansion, which, which is the next category. But when you order, when you create more of the same, but a variation of it, then you're talking about a brand extension. And of course, we know a lot of cereals that have extensions. They're, you know, uh, how about Cheerios? And then you have 
whole grain Cheerios, or you maybe have sugar coated uh, Cheerios. And so they all, um, they all are part of the same core product. So what is brand expansion? Well, brand expansion is also what I'll call category extension. And that means you're moving from one category laterally into another category. And because of that, it is inherently more risky. But when you do that, you give yourself the chance to broaden your presence into markets where they've not been. And if you've done your research right, you know that the consumer, the fan, the enthusiast is looking for your brand in that category. And you've measured that against your brand purpose, your brand promise, and what I call the brand expansion point. So brand expansions oftentimes rely on licensees to fill the experience and capacity gap on their, their behalf. Why? Because a company typically knows its core business very, very well, but those other categories, they don't have expertise in. If we go back to the Coca-Cola example, Coca-Cola is a beverage company. It's a marketing company, of course, but it's a beverage company. They know how to make, the system knows how to make Coca-Cola beverages. They don't know how to make apparel. They don't know how to make uh, shoes. They don't know how to make eyewear. They don't know how to make pins. And so they find companies that have the competency in those categories as good or better than they do in the beverage category, and they align with them through typically licensing arrangements. So I told you I would, tell, uh, I would explain what a brand expansion point is. This is that point where a brand um, is uh, connected with a consumer either physically or emotionally, and then pivots around that point physical point or emotional point to connect with the consumer in a broader or bigger way. So I say the expansion point of a brand is more than an idea. It's the single most powerful emotion or association bonded with that brand that people have. In fact, they believe in it so much that they want to see it expressed for themselves across multiple aspects of their lives. And so as we get into these case studies, you're going to see these brand expansion points come to life. So before we do that, though, let's talk about choosing where and when to expand. So when we think about where to expand, we want to know how quickly the sector is growing and what are the predicted growth patterns over the next five years. We don't want to be expanding into categories that are shrinking or that might have some challenges along the way. Maybe they're regulatory challenges, maybe they're legal challenges. In the case of what we're talking about uh, today with still COVID-19 being present, even though thankfully less present, there may be some issues around that and that could hurt you. So what do I mean by that? If you're in the travel industry, you want to expand into the travel industry, now may not be a good time. But once we get ahead of this virus with maybe a vaccine, then it could be a very good time. Secondarily, how long are the economic cycles of the sector? And how tightly does the sector typically mirror changes in the wider economy? If it's um, price inelastic, like, um, like we always use the example of milk, people are gonna buy milk whether the economy is weak or the economy is strong, uh, whether it's um, you know, milk from a dairy farm or, or almond milk. In either case, that category is going to be relatively stable. But if it mirrors the overall wider um, economy, then it may be suffering when the economy shrinks more than uh, a, a brand that or a category of product that is not affected as much. And then finally, what types of brands do best in, the sector, in that sector? Are they luxury brands or budget brands? Because you have to know your brand's architecture. You have to know your brand's positioning. If you're a mid-price point product, you don't want to be moving into a channel that is lower, lower level, or you don't want to be moving into a channel that's luxury level. You need to align um, your category, your brand with the categories that align with your, your product's position. Okay. So one last thing before we get into the case studies, and this is um, this, uh, uh, I'll call it uh, relationship or um, associative memory this, uh, this experience or this research that this professor did, Professor Samu uh, from Indiana University, where he was able to um, uh, 
just check if you would, if your, uh, your mic is on mute. If, if not, uh, please do so unless you have a question and I'm absolutely happy to answer any questions. But what Professor Samu um, experienced was that there was a relationship between brands and their associations. He said, brand names are stored as nodes in our memory. So I'll repeat that, brand names are stored as nodes in our memory and the various associations that we have with that name are stored as links. So we have a name that's, the, uh, that's stored as a node and the association we have with it and that association could be joy or fear or exuberance or depression. All of these things are stored as um, links in our memory. So exposure to the brand name activates the nodes and the links and that activity in turn strengthens the associations consumers make with the brand. So the more we understand how the links connect to our brand, the more we understand how the brand is going to engage with consumers and therefore where we can expand the brand. Okay, so in this case, we look at three brands, Coca-Cola, Ferrari, and Harley Davidson. And we're gonna do a little bit of a case study on Harley Davidson later. So let me talk about Coca-Cola and Ferrari. Coca-Cola, yes, it's a beverage brand, but what does it bring? And what does the brand mean? Well, the, the word I like to use about Coca-Cola is it brings happiness. If we think about Coca-Cola, we typically think about a, a warm memory, a warm memory when we were a child, when we had a Coke with our dad, maybe um, on a uh, hike, or they might be a warm memory with a significant other at um, a fun outing. But typically it, um, with Coca-Cola, it's around happiness, uh, the, that warm memory. And so that's the emotion that Coca-Cola connects with consumers. With Ferrari, um, and we talked about this on our uh, webinar last time, Ferrari is around speed and acceleration and exuberance. It's all around that high technology and um, that, uh, that powerful force that is the brand. So when we think about how can Ferrari expand, we want to think about that versus um, maybe some other thing. For example, uh, the fact that it's a high expense of luxury brand. It's more around the speed and acceleration that it's connected. So when a brand is less directly linked with a specific product type, the brand may fit easier, sorry, the brand may find it easier to encourage consumers to associate with the brand across a range of sectors. So what do I mean by that? Well, um, any of those particular brand um, attributes, right? The brand, uh, the way the brand connects in the case of Coca-Cola, I mentioned earlier, not only is it great for beverages, but it's also sells many, many uh, different types of apparel. It sells shoes, it sells hats, it sells pins, uh, it sells a whole host plush. Um, with Ferrari, what they did was they expanded into um, theme parks and they actually sponsor the world's fastest roller coaster. So this gives um, consumers who could never uh, purchase uh, the Ferrari car themse itself, themselves the opportunity to experience what the brand feels like. And then ultimately, they may be in a position in the future to actually purchase the vehicle. So as I said, I'm going to hold off on Harley Davidson because we're going to talk about that in a little bit. So here's our first case study, and it's around Turner Classic Movies. So the situation with, with TCM, as they like to call themselves, was TCM was looking for ways to drive brand awareness and revenue to the business. If you're not familiar, TCM is um, a network that's more than 30 years old, but they don't actually own the movies that they show. And that's what they do. They, they, they broadcast movies that are, not, that are owned by somebody else, but they do it in a way where there is no um, commercial interruption. Typically what will happen is there will be a couple of people um, introduced before the movie. They'll talk about the movie. They'll talk about the maybe the plot, they'll talk about the characters, and then they show the movie uninterrupted. So the people that um, know TCM love the brand, I mean, love with a capital L, but TCM wanted to branch out and get further uh, expanded 
outside of their core business, which is broadcasting movies via their network. So they conducted, or this is the task, they conducted research and learned that fans wanted to get together to watch their movies. Okay, that's a great insight. And so they started brainstorming ideas and they came up with more than 40 ideas. Some were small, some were large, um, some were crazy, some were doable. And so they decided to take action. And what they tried, decided to do as their first expansion, and this makes sense, right? Because if you think about what they chose to do, it's very closely aligned with what they currently do or the core business. And so TCM chose to create a film festival in old Hollywood. And they wanted to create a destination where fans could really come together because that's what they like to do, right? Come together to watch movies. And so they created this festival and I think it's been going on now for about six or seven years where they would show about a hundred films across seven venues over a long weekend. And so they had droves of people coming to old Hollywood to watch a bunch of the the typical most, um, I would say most popular movies that they typically would show on their network. And what they discovered from that was a lot of great things. They discovered that this um, film festival was their main DNA. It offered public relations, it offered marketing, it offered brand love, it, in, it offered fan loyalty and talent relations. And it also, because they brought some of the actors in, and it also in, in enabled them to improve the relationship with their industries. It effectively, and this is the words of Jennifer Dorian, who was running the business at the time, it became their calling core. It became their calling card. And so nominal royalty came from it, but all of those other things also came from it. And if you think about that, what would it have cost them to generate all that buzz, all those relationships, all that brand love, well, it would have been astronomical. And because they did it in a licensing format, they were able to share those costs with a lot of different licensees. But one of the things they also discovered was if they could pivot, and that means not, not refrain from doing what they're doing, but add another category. So they decided to pivot into cruise ships and they did a themed cruise ship, uh, cruise experience. And of course, up until this year, that has been very financially successful for them, in addition to all those other things that we just talked about. Hey, Ella, I saw that there might have been a, a question raised. Would you let me know if there's anything we need to address? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, do we know uh, who had the question? Uh, I'm not sure. If we look in the chat box, we may be able to determine. Maybe there was just a comment made. Okay. If not, we can keep going. I just yeah, thought. I don't see anything now, but um, I'll keep an eye. If you, if you do have a question, please don't hesitate to ask, of course. Yeah, and you can even interrupt me, as I said earlier. Okay, let's go to the next slide and talk about better homes and gardens. Um, but before I jump into the relationship uh, between Better Homes and Gardens in this particular case study, I want to mention um, another brand expansion that they currently have, which to me, when I heard how long it was, it really blew me away. And that is, and, and, and by the way, the company is called Meredith. They're based out of Iowa. They own a number of um, magazine brands, including Better Homes and Gardens. And one of the biggest, longest uh, brand licensing arrangements they have is with a company called Rheology, Rheology, R-E-A-L-O-G-Y Corporation. And there they have um, the Better Homes and Gardens real estate uh, relationship or, or license. And the, the duration of this license is 50 years, five zero years, that's a long time. Clearly they must know this company very, very well and feel very confident uh, in uh, giving them that, um, that duration. But if, you've any, if any of you have ever seen um, a Better Homes and Gardens sign uh, in front of a home, you'll know that that actually uh, is a licensing arrangement with a company called Rheology Corporation and Meredith Corporation. So just a food for thought on what is possible, right? So Meredith with Better Homes and Gardens can get into real estate. In this particular case, I want to talk about a situation with Walmart. 
Um, and here, Walmart had a flourishing backyard furniture business but wanted to shift indoors, right? So many of you may be aware that you can buy outdoor furniture at Walmart. And the, the business they had was very, very successful, um, but they didn't have any real strength indoors. And so they thought if they could tie in with better homes and gardens, that would enable them to reach out to house proud consumers and find, help them find ways to fall in love with the products that they had in their stores. So think about who reads Better Homes and Gardens, what is their aspirational needs, and how can those needs be served? And of course, part of that might be through um, furniture, and in this case, indoor furniture. So what Better Homes and Gardens and Walmart did was they tied up together, and the success of the initiative enabled Better Homes and Gardens to cultivate new product lines with new customers. So they were able to expand their product line from magazines and real estate now into indoor furniture. And so think about all of the individuals that potentially could be buying that furniture who had heard of the Better Homes and Gardens brand, maybe didn't have an intimate familiarity with it, but because they bought the furniture would now consider using the real estate and also maybe even read the print and digital magazine. So what were the results? Well, the relationship helped Walmart to change the conversation they were having uh, with this consumer group from one of practicality of polyester, right? A conversation about how good is the physical properties of the indoor furniture they were selling to now an emotional relationship, right? Now they were buying the Better Homes and Gardens brand, which people had a consum as, as consumers had an emotional relationship with. And so the experience was much fuller, much richer, and much more emotional, which is always what we want to do is connect with consumers on an emotion, especially for those well-established brands. And if, uh, if you are familiar at all, this has been a very, very successful relationship. Walmart and Better Homes and Gardens in, in furniture has been uh, really a match made in heaven. And so it's been great for the brand, Better Homes and Gardens. It's also been great for uh, the retailer, Walmart. And um, I would say it's, it's been terrific for the consumers who've purchased the merchandise as well. Okay, now I wanna to get to a different brand, one that I had a personal engagement with. And I don't buy Bulgari, but I certainly know of the Bulgari brand and know it is a high-end luxury brand that is um, worn by you know, movie stars and athletes and um, people who really just wanna feel special. And I, I'm, you know, to quote the chief executive, Jean-Christophe Babine, he said that Bulgari has a mission of making the lady more unique and more special. So you can imagine um, for me, uh, I was on my honeymoon in Bali, Indonesia, 11 years ago, and I'm driving around the island with my wife, Emily, and um, it's a gorgeous place. So I highly encourage you to go if you've not been. And if you have been, I would imagine that we would have a great conversation about how beautiful a uh, place it is. But we're driving all around the island and we get to kind of one of the um, out kind of the areas farther away from where we were staying. And we came up upon this Bulgari resort. And I, I remember exclaiming to Emily, I was like, whoa, wait a second. I thought Bulgari was into jewelry and the watches and things like that. I didn't know they were into resorts. And uh, she kind of looked at me like I knew nothing <laughs> and said, uh, yeah, of course they are. And I said, wow, okay. So fast forward a few years later, and I'm doing research on the Bulgari brand, and I realized that um, this, in fact, was a brand extension. Uh, this is, sorry, brand expansion. And the reason that Bulgari ventured into the resorts, and they did it, by the way, through the Ritz group, and you can imagine if they're going to pick a group to do it, they want to do it with one that really understands luxury and experiences, right? And Ritz-Carlton knows that very, very well. And, and so that should also ask you to maybe cause yourself to ask the question, hmm, why do we think that Ritz was willing to be, in addition to being a brand owner of a very, very successful line of resort hotels, to be a licensee, right, to the Bulgari brand? Well, they saw an opportunity for themselves to grow, and they're smart enough to know when there is an opportunity, they should uh, take advantage of it if it makes sense, right? So they they tied up with one of the most luxuri luxurious brands in the world, and they, um, the Bulgari Resort opened 
its first hotel in Milan. Of course, that makes sense, right? It's an Italian brand uh, based out of Milan. Uh, and they opened that in 2004. And as you can see, there was others that were included, uh, others that include Bali, which is the one I saw, Dubai, London, and Paris. And I think actually Shanghai may be another location as well. Um, and I would just say about this, that um, initially for me, I had this big question mark, but when I thought about what the brand was trying to accomplish, it, it, it made sense, right? And I would say when brands truly understand their consumers, they create opportunities for special experiences to happen. And when those new experiences happen, they create new opportunities for the brand to consider further steps, right? Further lateral steps. And so the idea of a Bulgari hotel did not clash with my preconceptions of the brand for I believe it indeed was a jewel. And so now my, my own personal uh, understanding of the Bulgari brand expanded to realize that this was really about special luxury between the brand and women uh, that could include beyond jewelry into resorts. And who knows where they'll go next. But if you tie back to what um, their, their CEO said, it's going to be about something that makes the woman feel special. And I, I, I think they do it better than practically anyone out there. So before we um, go into the next case study, I wanted to talk a little bit about Ken Favaro's diversification. And what is this diversification? And he says that successful diversification requires a couple of things. The first one is a material improvement in the overall value proposition of the brand and the business. So if there's not a material improvement, you probably don't want to diversify. The second thing is it needs to have enough of the company's distinctive capabilities. Think about the brands I just talked about. Think about the Bulgari brand, right? Enough of the distinctive capabilities present to give the brand a right to win in the new market. Did Bulgari have a right to win in resorts? Obviously with a resounding yes, they did indeed, but they did it very precisely and very, um, I would say very strategically. And they only chose to do it in a very, very special way. So if you want to experience a Bulgari resort, you've got about a half a dozen opportunities around the world and that's it. Otherwise, you're going to have to buy the, the jewelry in order to experience the brand. So let's talk about Harley Davidson. I've kept you waiting long enough, right? <laughs> so I love this brand uh, because of what it does and it provides the lifestyle of freedom and rebellion against unquestioning conformity. Let me repeat that. The brand provides the lifestyle of freedom and rebellion against unquestioning conformity. Um, I think most of us who know anything about the brand would say, yep, that's what it does. And so what makes them great is they are able to take that, which is that brand expansion point, that's what we talked about earlier, and expand into any category where they can reinforce that expansion point emotion. So while it started out in their core category being motorcycles, right? And many, many of the Harley Davidson brand, uh, sorry, consumers own the motorcycle. But I would venture to say that many, many more than own the, the motorcycle actually own something else. So um, the ones that own the motorcycle probably own a lot of other different uh, products that have the Harley, Harley Davidson brand on it. But I would venture to say that probably there's more people who don't own the motorcycle that own the brand in some other capacity. So how can you own the brand? Well, if you go to Manhattan, uh, hopefully soon when the, when the city opens, you can buy a Harley burger at their restaurant right in the heart of, um, of the city. Uh, you can choose a shirt, you can buy the perfume, or you can hit the road. And when you hit the road, you also become part of a club. And so, that gives um, Harley the ability to really connect in many, many different ways. And so the products extend the brand's reach and therefore the customer base and for um, far beyond the motorcycling community. In fact, they have a lot of uh, toy examples. So little kids can get on a replica Harley Davidson. And so if they have a love for the brand when they're little, imagine what they're going to do when they have some disposable income, right? So I think Harley is a phenomenal example 
of how a brand connects emotionally and how it expands around its expansion point in order to uh, build its business, reach uh, the consumer, and build its universe. Okay, so we're getting close to the end, and um, this is one of my favorite case studies, and this is around Disney's Mickey Mouse. And so it, we all know that Mickey Mouse has been around a long time, but it was actually, for those who don't know, was actually created back in 1928 by Walt Disney and another gentleman named Ub Iwerks. UB uh, is his first name and Iwerks, uh, or Iwerks maybe, I-W-E-R-K-S. Um, and in 1934, at the height of the Depression, General Foods, the makers of Post Toasties, paid $1 million for the right to put Mickey Mouse cutouts on the back of their cereal boxes. So think about how much a million dollars in 1934 would re relate to today. I don't know the math, I sh I'll, next time I'll find out, but I would venture to say it has to be north of probably $30 million and maybe as high as $50 million for that right. That's how powerful the brand was six years after it was created. Uh, another example, in one day, Macy's New York sold a, a record one, sorry, 11,000 timepieces featuring the Mickey Mouse image. So let's fast forward from that time frame, which was back in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, to 2003. In 2003, Mickey Mouse turned 75. And what Walt Disney wanted to do was reinforce the connection between the brand and its fans. And the fans ventured in age from six to 86, 96. And so by, by reconnecting with them, they just wanted to re remind those fans why they fell in love with Mickey Mouse. So what did they do? Using Mickey Mouse's 75th birth birthday to increase the relevance, they developed a whole new line of apparel. And the apparel was um, developed by engaging with the hottest designers um, to create an, um, a high-end vintage program that they sold at a luxury retail store in Los Angeles called Fred Siegel. And to promote the line, they showcased Mickey, this Mickey Mouse apparel um, with Mickey seated next to celebrities who were wearing the apparel, and they featured it in top shops, including top shows, including Sex in the City. And so what happened from this? Well, the result was the program created tremendous buzz, tremendous PR, and Mickey Mouse was revitalized and, re and, and refreshed in the minds of many, many people who, who maybe thought of Mickey as being a little bit stale. It was so successful that on Women's Wear Daily, it became ranked as one of the top 100 most influential fashion brands and continues to this day to be in the top 100. Here we are in 2020, 17 years after the celebration, and that brand apparel program has still relevance. And why? Because it reminds the fans why they love Mickey Mouse. So nothing connected to entertainment, just a way to engage with the mouse in a way that was special and symbolic and um, meaningful. So there's a cool example too with the Mickey Mouse brand. So let's finish up with seven, I'll call those probing questions about what we should think about before we decide to expand. And so the first one is, what exactly is the problem that you're solving for buyers? And why would consumers look to you to solve it? So what is the problem you're solving? And why do you think you're the, the brand that should be introduced to solve that problem? Second, is your brand closely linked to a specific product set or to a more general idea? Remember, when I, it's a more general idea, an emotion like Coca-Cola, like Harley Davidson, you can pivot around that emotion. When you're tied to a more specific product set, you have to stay within that set. An example of a product set would be the M&M's brand or the Suzuki motorcycle brand. So if it is the latter, more around a general idea, what qualifies your brand to take ownership of that broader idea? Make sure you do your homework there because many times brand owners think they can go far beyond where consumers or fans or enthusiasts actually give them permission. Third, are you big enough and well-known enough to extend or expand? 
I meet with a lot of people who say they want to license their brand, but I find out that their brand really isn't even that well known, let alone loved by many, many consumers. And so what makes you more than a fad in the minds of those who buy into you? Is this one of these things where it's going to be here today, but gone tomorrow? Fourth, what do consumers want more of from your brand, if anything? You need to know the answer to that question. They may not want anything more from you, in, this, in which case you cannot expand. But if you know what they want more of, then go there. And will the association make sense to the consumer? Remember, it has to pass that smell test. And will it change their world for the better? Do you bring a competitive advantage to the category? Is it one of those where the consumer or the fan, the enthusiast is going to say, oh my gosh, I'm so glad that ABC brand went into that category because I love this product. And had they not done it, I probably would not have bought it. Fifth, how does your brand fit into the lives of your core consumers? What latitude will they give the brand to take up more space in their lives? Right? Are you... Um, a brand like Starbucks, where you reside uh, in the lives of your consumers, maybe around the morning hours, or have you expanded enough now that you're, th you're thought of all during the day? Are you thought of in one geographic location or are you thought of globally? Those kinds of questions have to be answered before you can consider ex brand expansion. Sixth, do the dynamics of the sector you are looking to expand to warrant your presence? Do the dynamics of the category or sector you are looking to expand into warrant your presence? Again, that should be a resounding yes, not maybe. Not, and definitely, if it's no, then, then don't go there. You will not be successful. And then finally, how will you counter the downsides of being more widely available? And what I mean by that is we learned from last time, the more you're spread out, the less uh, influence you have. So the, think about the brands that you love and why you love them. They're typically really, really solid and they go very, very deep. The brands that have spread very, very thin typically don't have as much of an emotional connection. So you have to be very thoughtful about the categories you consider, just like the Bulgari brand did, right? It started out with jewelry and then it went into watches and then it leaped. And I say leap because it was a huge leap. They leaped into the resort category, but they're in very, very few categories. And when they're in them, they're in them in a very meaningful way. Okay. This is a, re a fresher from last week. This is the lateral expandability score chart. So as you think about your brand, you should score it. One, will, it, will we only ever stay in the one category? And you have to be honest here, right? Back in, uh, back in the day, probably back in, I would say, the 1940s and 50s, Coca-Cola probably thought they were only going to be a beverage company. Of course, today they are many, more, many, many more things, but they evolved to that point. Two, we could extend our brand to include new or evolving opportunities, but still within our core category. So that is on the periphery, right? And that is um, examples where... Um, TCM, for example, where they were about showing movies on their network, and then they decided to host a film festival. That, to me, um, if they just did that, they would score themselves a two. Three, we could extend our brand into a number of related categories. Okay, now we're branching out further and further. Four, our brand has enough latitude to expand into a new and unrelated category with strong growth characteristics. We have the opportunity, fit, and leverage to do that successfully. And, I, and the example with Bulgaria would be perfect here, right? A new and unrelated category, but they're definitely tied to their brand expansion point. And then finally, five, our customers align with our brand on emotive much more than product lines. As long as we stay consistent with that emotion, we can take the brand into a range of different and unrelated sectors. If you think of any of the Disney brands, you will find that almost all of them fit in the five category. They are connecting purely on emotion and the emotion is reinforced in each category they go into. They are best in class when it comes to brand expansion. Okay. We are at that point where we can pause and um, take questions. So I'd like to remind everybody that we created uh, um, a lasso algorithm uh, to help you assess your brand's um, uh, brand expansion optimality. 
And so uh, I will encourage you to take advantage of this uh, algorithm and score your brand and see if it lines up with what you think. Right now, we have relatively small amount of data, so the accuracy is about 80%. But as more and more of you get involved and score your brands, we believe that accuracy will increase potentially up to about 90%. So let me, um, let me pause at this point um, and let you uh, come off uh, sharing screen and, and, and let's, ask some, let's answer some questions that you might have. But before I do that, if you want to um, participate in our news newsletter, just text the word Pete, P-E-T-E, -E, to 345345, and you'll um, join our list. Okay, let's, uh, let's see what questions you guys have. Okay. I'm opening up the chat. Hey, Pete. Hi, Mark. Awesome presentation. I learned so much. And uh, so what I respect about your company, and I want to ask, so we talked about a lot of big companies, Coca-Cola, Harley, and all that stuff. So a lot of us have a brand, which is pretty much us. It's, it's Mark Gresh. It's Pete. So on your slide deck, your name is in the lower left corner, front and center, boom. And, 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 and your website for your company is yourname.com. I love it. Um, when I opened my company 10 years ago, I kind of took the same approach. You know, my company's name is Rush Group. My website's rushgroup.com. And my rationale was what you see is what you get. I'm not going to hide behind some fancy name like a lot of companies out there. So I guess my question to you is, uh, you know, what's the differentiator between, you know, having yourself as your brand, what you see is what you get, um, as opposed to maybe coming up with some fancy marketing some fancy names, um, and, and, and ha, you know, is it, is it a good idea to kind of have your own person as your brand, or is it better to, you know, use some marketing tools and, and some fancy, you know, names and graphics? Yeah, that is really a fabulous question, Mark, and, and believe me, I I've, I've went through this evolution myself. When I started my company 11 years ago, I, uh, titled the name of my company, Licensing Brands, Inc. I wanted to um, make it very clear to my target audience what I was doing. I was helping them license. And then I showcased myself as an expert. But as I evolved my company, I realized that I had to really focus on my own personal branding because I was the thought leader for my company. And so it was important for people to get to know me and what I stood for. And then most recently, what we said was, okay, let's evolve the company name to Brand Alive because we're about helping brands come alive in the hearts of those that experience them. Right. And so I am the thought leader for our company, but I am only one thought leader. And as I grow my company, I want more and more people to participate. So two things, one of which is you need to understand your own brand architecture and your own brand promise and think about yourself individually. And, I, and I'm sharing this with everybody, right? Think about yourselves as a brand first and make sure as a brand um, that you're communicating everything consistently, ruthlessly consistently, I say. Um, so now the question gets back to you and what you're trying to accomplish, right? What is your mission or what is your purpose? That will help decide whether or not you should stay with your, your name, the rest group, or potentially consider something else. But with all of these, and, and this is one of the principles that makes licensing so powerful, is it takes a lot of time, a lot of money, um, a lot of um, effort to build a brand. And so um, you're building your own personal brand. I'm doing the same thing. I'm also building the Brand Alive brand. But for some individuals who have a great product or service, they may be better off um, focusing on um, borrowing someone else's brand, just like um, you saw in these examples with these apparel companies that made the merchandise for the Disney brand. They, they had to be best in class. They had to know how to build the attributes of the Mickey Mouse brand into those, into those products. Uh, and then they found that they could win through um, licensing that Mickey Mouse brand. Instead of selling um, 100, they could sell 1,000 or 10,000. Um, right. The example with the, the 11,000 timepieces that were sold in like 1934, I think it was at the Macy's Parade. So the answer to your question is really get to, um, and I, I say this for everyone, 
answer why you're doing what you're doing. If you can answer the why first, that will help you understand whether it's something you should stick with yourself on or whether you should extend. And let's think of some examples, right? Um, uh, Richard Branson with the Virgin brand. Um, those two were synonymously aligned. Lately, Virgin has decided to do some other things that don't really tie with the brash person that Richard Branson is. And so he has kind of drifted a little bit from that for Virgin. But for himself, everyone knows exactly what he is. How about Jeff Bezos and Amazon? Similarly, right? Amazon is Jeff Bezos. And the last example would be Elon Musk, right? With Tesla and with SpaceX. I mean, but all of those companies um, speak to uh, the personality of the founder. But, but in the case of Tesla and SpaceX, let's think about that, right? SpaceX, what does that mean? It's very intuitive. It's like licensing brands. They're going into space exploration uh, and they're partnering with, um, with NASA and other entities to do that. Uh, in the case of Tesla, he, he borrowed from one of the founding um, inventors of electricity, right? Yeah. Um, in the Italian Tesla. So there's some examples, but for you, I think stay, you, you have equity with the rest group. So probe on that, probe on why you do what you do, and then maybe explore whether or not it still makes sense. And I, I'm guessing it probably does, but you might want to do or consider doing what I'm doing, which is be the face of it, but then potentially um, think of another name for your company. Yep. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> Who else? What else? Any other thoughts or questions? One new message. Let's see what it is. Okay. Um, all right. Well, listen, I am having so much fun doing this. Uh, this has been a blast. It was something that I thought I could do to give back a little bit once, um, you know, the, uh, the sequestering started two months ago with, with COVID-19. But I found that there's a lot of individuals who are appreciating what, uh, what we're doing here with the brand expansion webinar series. So we're just going to keep it going. I'm going to send a questionnaire to each of you and I'd love for you to answer it. It's like six questions. Uh, and if you only want to answer one, just answer the one and respond. But one of the questions I'm going to ask is, do you think this frequency is good? Every two weeks is when we have this, uh, have this call or this uh, chat. And I, I like the frequency in the sense that it gives you time to kind of get away, think about what we're talking about and come back. But maybe it's too frequent for you. And in which case, we would love to know that so that we can be more responsive because without your input, we're going to keep doing what we're doing. But we've learned a few things along the way. And one of those was, like, for example, today, um, you can just enter this webinar without me letting you in. So there's no interruption if you have to, if you have to take a little bit of time before you jump in. But I, I want to thank you all emphatically for, for joining us today. This is recorded, so we will post it on our um, YouTube channel. Um, and then uh, you can go there for not only this webinar, but all the other ones as well. And uh, there's about 30 odd other um, small, smaller, shorter videos that I've done that give little snippets of information. And so uh, that's my uh, way to give back and to encourage each of you to really go after your dream and, and overcome because uh, together we can do that. So I ask you, what can you do today to make your brand come alive in the hearts of those who experience it.